Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. Want to call the meeting to order? I don't know how to do these meetings. I've never done one. <laughs> That's why you're here. Well, normally the chair starts the meeting, since you'll have another meeting for a while, and the person who actually was the chair uh, is no longer a member. So we have a quorum. Yes. So probably the first order of business, even though <clears throat> um, it would be for you all to select the chair. If you'd like, you can put that on the bands until the next meeting. If you want to do that, that's fine. Um, in that case, we can let Greg run, run the meeting. Or like I said, normally the chair runs the meetings. Uh, the liaison, it was Captain Perks, will be here to assist, advise, recommend that kind of things. But you all are the ones that run the meeting and make the decisions for the board. So it's up to you. Do you want to? You don't know each other very well, but if you want to discuss it and select the chair, that's fine. If not, we can proceed and let Greg run this meeting and, uh, like I said, put the, the election of the chair into the uh, next meeting. We are missing two members who aren't able to be here tonight. So, so it would be appropriate for me to move that we delay this decision until the next meeting. Sure, sure, absolutely. Second. There we go. We'll move it to the next meeting. Which we party? gotta get all in favor? All in favor. There you go. All right. Pretty good. <laughs> and we will be holding another meeting. I'll, I'll be putting that out for next month because once we get through tonight and next month, I'll have another meeting which will have a bigger agenda on it with some actual traffic issues, et cetera. Good. Point up. Yep. So basically tonight, uh, our agenda for tonight was to go over the documents that I sent. I already got the PowerPoint open. Yep, there you go. Um, and just go over this and discuss it. Um, and for those of you who don't know, this gentleman sitting over here is Sergeant Jason Flannery. He's my traffic sergeant. Um, he's here as my my matter expert because um, he, he does all of our traffic and everything. So if we have any questions going over the PowerPoint presentation, if I can't answer it, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jason to, to do that. Is it being shared, boss? It is. It should be on the Zoom for everybody. <clears throat> All right. So basically, uh, this the Western Rose Traffic Advisory Commission. Uh, today's date. All this information. Boy, can we move this up? We can. Mm -hmm. There we go. All this information obviously was obtained from the city of Wexford with policies and from the uh, United States Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is what we call the MUTCD. We're going to go over that this evening as well. And at any time, if you guys have any questions or want, want me to go into de uh, detail explaining out some of the processes that are going to be laid out here, just, just let me know, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So important facts to remember about this. First off, the police department, uh, its goal is not to write numerous traffic or parking citations. So when we think about traffic control devices, speed limits and that kind of stuff, then our objective is not numerous traffic or parking citations, okay? Driver pedestrian compliance is required for safety to reduce death, injuries and property damage. And I want you to focus on driver and pedestrian compliance because that's gonna be a big issue that we we'll talk about when going through all these, these uh, manuals and requirements put out for by the uh, MUTCD. And that makes it imperative to ensure that any new traffic ordinances meet the standards and are absolutely necessary. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. That's not gonna work. If you want everybody to mask up, if you want to Wait, you're speaking. I think we might be good to take that down so people can understand. Can, you want me to take it down? I've been aiming at both communications. You getting a booster? But not yet. They're not out yet for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> My wife got hers so uh, last week. All right, frequent resident requests. Um, these are the number one complaints that Sergeant Flannery and I get uh, across our desks, and these are from citizens, and, and they're requesting speed bumps. Uh, saw horses and or barricades, uh, changing directions of streets to one ways, speed limit reductions, no through truck traffic, uh, no parking on one side of the street or requests to remove no parking, individual uh, disabled or handicapped spots, disabled spots at, at individual residences. Uh, any questions about any of those and everybody understand what they are? Some of these requests that are up there uh, require, or require we, we would prefer a petition 
um, which is then would be reviewed by you as a TAC. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the petitions a little bit later as well. Yes. So will we circle back to each of these things and be able to go into depth? So yeah, we can do that, absolutely. Or should we, can I ask specific questions now? No, What's go ahead, the, ask, yeah. Ask okay, well, because I think that there are some notes. Can you say your name before you, because I don't know who everybody is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, are before you speak. yeah, I'm Ann Barenkamp, okay. and I've been vaccinated. I'm going to get a booster soon. I'm going to mix and match. Um, okay, I was wondering, so so the no through truck traffic, yes. there actually is an ordinance. There is, and we actually will talk specifically about no through truck traffic a little later. I actually okay. have some PowerPoint slides on that Sweet. specific one because that one is a, is a big one. Yeah, because you guys are down officers, so I feel like you can't enforce it's, it, which is maybe the problem. You can, but it's a, it's a targeted enforcement, but we'll dive into what no through traffic entails, okay. and particularly some requirements that we have to have if we were to go to, uh, go to a no through truck traffic ordinance on the street. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically speed bumps and saw horses under barricades. Speed bumps, we do not do at all in the city of Webster. There's too many liability issues with that, particularly with inclement weather, um, snow plows on the, on the trucks during the winter. Um, and chime in on some of the stuff I'm missing on. Yeah, it's mainly snow plows. Your street, your street will never get plowed again if you have speed bumps. Well, it damages the, it damages damages the, 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 uh, the equipment. That's the main thing. And then the other issue is there is liability. Or vehicles that actually go over themselves on the public street. So those are the two main reasons. Right. The primary one being that public works really does not want speed bumps because when they're doing the snow plowing or for the icing or whatever it might be, those it uh, damages the equipment badly. Right. And when you say and this, I'm Carrie Falconrath. When you say speed bump, is that traditional speed bump like we have at the rec center and not speed humps, which are the more tables that you see? <clears throat> Either one of the if they use <clears throat> what the public works is concerned about is the Basically, they're assuming that it's a level road with no impediments. The ones that are on private lots, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, mm -hmm. but, so, but on the public streets, that's where it becomes a big issue. Okay. All right. Any other questions on any of these? These are pretty self explanatory. Right. Well, the sawhorses and barricades, again, on public streets, it really is not <clears throat> a feasible thing. It's a public street, everybody pays taxes. Um, want to be able to people have access in three ways so that we don't it, it's one thing that we don't uh, do is put out saw us with parts of barricades to impede traffic if, if you have seen them around there are some private streets within Webster that have them that's a private street funded by the residents on those streets our our uh, MUTCD stuff does not go into play on those mm -hmm. All right, petitions. When residents request a change to a traffic or parking ordinance or request that a new ordinance be created, they are asked to submit a petition with signatures from all residents that will be affected, even if it's on adjoining streets. This is Joe Majority support. Now, this is not a requirement. This is a request from us um, because if we were to petition something and put it to you all for a vote, and then you have 50% of the residents that, that is being affected don't want this, then we need to know that. So this is what we ask for, for any type of new ordinance or a change to an ordinance to, to come into play. Traffic control devices, important to remember the traffic control device only directs a driver and or pedestrian to do something. It does not force them to comply. Distracted drivers and those not aware of the surroundings will uh, not follow regulations regardless of how apparent they are. And I talked about that earlier. So when we talk about this, we, we can only put up signage to, to give people direction, whether they comply with it or not on them. So the signage, that kind of stuff does not force compliance. It just sets the rules for what the words are, but you know, distracted drivers and people not aware, they're, they're going to not follow it. And we, obviously, we can enforce it. <clears throat> Correct. The object is to, 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 to have some uniformity and make sure that get the person in this later. Is it following as a regular standards that apply? So that we get majority of compliance because we can't obviously we have a limited amount of human resources and enforcement effort. So we want to make sure that most of the majority of things that we're doing are things that that Pete, the drivers are going to comply with voluntarily. Correct. We'll talk about that later when we get into the speeding and stop signs and that kind of stuff and where some of this guidance comes from. So can driving control devices should be five requirements: fulfill a need, command attention, convey a clear, simple meaning, command respect from road users compliance and give adequate time for a proper response. So when we think about that as well, we need to actually have drivers have enough time to respond to the signage 
um, that, 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 is, that is in place. So we don't want to put a sign up right here and the pet drivers no way that they can comply with that and they, they're violating it because they didn't have time to do it. Mm -hmm. so. All right, so what is the MUTCD? It's manual, manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, it sets minimum standards and provides guidance to ensure uniformity of traffic control devices across the nation. The use of the uniform TCDs, message, location, size, shapes, and colors help reduce crashes and congestion and improves the efficiency of the surface transportation system. Uh, just so if you know, I mean, you notice when you go through our town and to other states and everything, how most of your, all of your speed limit signs, all of, they're all the same size, same lettering, same everything. That's that's all set forth by the MUTCD. It's governed by the United States Department of Transportation Federal Highway Admission, and it has been in existence for 86 years. All right, so now we're going to talk some specifics about some stuff with big issues, stop signs and speed limits and that kind of stuff. Um, so this is where some questions are going to come into play for you, and, and please ask if you understand, uh, and we can explain in detail. Vehicular volume entering the intersection from the major street approaches, totaling in, of both approaches, averages at least 300 vehicles per eight hours for any eight hours of an average day. That's the first requirement. And the combined vehicular, pedestrian, and bicycle volume entering the intersection from the minor street approaches totally both uh, averages uh, at least 200 units per hour for the same eight hours within an average day. Um, and there must be a minor street vehicular traffic of at least 30 seconds per vehicle, a, a delay 30 seconds per vehicle during the highest hour. If the 85th percentile approach speed of that major tra street traffic exceeds 40 mile an hour, then the minimum vehicular volume warrants are 70% of the values listed above, right? So if it's if the roadway, if, excuse me, if we get into the 85th percentile, which I'll explain a, a little bit more, if that dictates or, or says that the speed limit is gonna be 40 mile an hour above on that roadway, those parameters set above are reduced by uh, to 70%. So I'm sorry, just thinking out loud here. So you're saying when a busy street is also a high velocity street, you want to control that for, in, for people who are turning or for pedestrians, slow them down so that people can get in and out. Well, yes, that's that, a stop sign I mean, standard. Yeah. Okay, so yes. That, so basically what we're saying, and let me I draw it up here for you guys, because this was the best way to explain it. So, I move over here. Just a little bit. What's that? I'm moving over. Yeah, the center. Sorry, everybody. I can see it. I just want to zoom. Thanks. Okay. So if we have a major intersection, right, and we want to do a stop sign, mm -hmm. and this is the main thoroughfare for that road, mm -hmm. there has to be 300 cars that pass through this intersection, either going this way or that way, per hour for an eight-hour period. Mm -hmm. the, the minor roadway is going this way. You have to have 200 cars per hour. And there one, also, or, one or the other or both? Both. So both. it has to meet both requirements. Okay. So basically you have to have 500 vehicles going through this intersection per hour on an eight-hour day on average. Okay, to justify a stop sign. To justify a stop sign. That's okay. just standard MUTCD guidelines. Got it. Now, this way, the minor ones too, there also has to be a 30-second delay. So that means you can't have car, 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 car. There's going to be delays to it. So they, they set this out. On, and that's on average, you mean? On average. Okay, thank on you. On average, because this is the main thoroughfare. And yeah. like you don't want to impede the flow of the main thoroughfare. Right. Right, because that's that's the arterial road. This is a subsidiary road. Got it. So that's where those numbers come from. Now, if this road is 40 mile an hour or greater, we only require 70% of that. So 70% uh, of 300. Okay. So 200 and something cars on this way each hour and then 70% of the 200 cars. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because when I read it, yes, it, it was <laughs> confusing. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it can be very confusing. And wait till I get into Webster Groves' ordinance where we've actually reduced those numbers significantly for our roadways. Okay. So we're, we're going to get into those in a minute. Is there Chris, right? Yes. Okay. Just checking. I forgot my name tag. All right. So that's for a stop sign. Uh, what is this? Okay, this is the growth standard. All right, so here's how we are going to get into reducing it for what the recommended standards of the manual and uniform traffic control device for streets and highways will continue to apply to all arterial and collector streets. Exceptions will be made for those requests where it's determined there is a problem related to 
documented high speeds, i.e. we do a speed study and or traffic enforcement. And we've got a lot of people violating the, the speed limit on that, on that street. Mm -hmm. Restricted view, our limited sight distance, which creates a hazard. Serious accident record, i.e. we get a police department is handling a lot of auto crashes on that street or at that intersection. And then assigned right of way at uh, confusing intersection or crosswalk configurations. Like it's just a confusing intersection. It's, you know, something like that. We can, we can take a look at that. Okay. All right, so here's our standards. On all the streets, the recommended standards will be amended to, there's a 70, 30% vehicular volume split for a four-way intersection which means 70% of vehicles on the main, 30% on the uh, secondary. There is 75 to 25% vehicle split on a three-way intersection. There are three or more preventable accidents in one year. And we have an intersection that just has three or more that's were preventable. Uh, the intersection is within 300 feet of a public facility, be a school, park, athletic facility, library, church, or shopping center. And then this is where we've reduced it. The total vehicular volume entering the intersection from all approaches averages at least 250 units per hour for the same eight hours of an average day, a 50% reduction. And then the combined vehicular and pedestrian volume for the minor street averages at least 100. So we reduced it from uh, 500 total down to 250 total. And then we combined vehicle down from 200 to 100 in the same hour, 50% reduction again. And then we go back to the 85th percentile approach, speed on the major street, traffic exceeds 35 mile per hour. Uh, with the vehicular volume warranting is 50% of the two previous requirements. All right, so if, if speed limit's only 35, you can look at it and it'll be reduced or if it meets the other two criteria. Mm -hmm. Now, this standard that you're describing is in place now? That is Webster Grove's, uh, I believe it's an ordinance that was passed, correct? It wasn't an ordinance. It was a policy set by the board. We reduced it by 50% because of concerns. Our streets, as you know, are very small. They're not wide, it's rather narrow. And also because of the denseness of the, of the uh, city and the traffic. Uh, probably, I think it was 2002 or 2004, somewhere in there. When we took a look at all the MQTCD standards, we decided that for our city, we would reduce it to 50% on the minor streets. Now, on the, as Greg just went over, on the arterial and collateral streets, such as uh, Elm Avenue, Big Bend, Brentwood Boulevard, those streets, we kept the main standard, but on all, most of the other residential streets, the standard here applies, we reduced it by 50% so that more intersections would be uh, available for stop signs. Quite honestly though, on almost every stop sign request we, we get, it still does not meet this. There's been there. There were a lot of stop signs put in place that didn't meet warrants many years ago in the 1950s, 40s, and 50s. That are still there. We're not taking them down. But we're not putting up anything that doesn't meet this warrant unless there's some exceptional circumstance. So, even with the reduced standards, there's very few uh, intersections that aren't already stop signs that would meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. Vehicular traffic just doesn't need it. You mean the old criteria or this one? This, this one. This one. Okay. Even, even this one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Even the reduced one. So, Chief, I think you just answered the question I had was there are some stop signs that appear not to meet this standard. That was probably put in place a long time ago before even this policy. Mm -hmm. and as a result, we're not moving. Yes, we're not moving. Yeah, we're not taking them down. And, and is there any thought to reviewing all of those and resetting? No. Well, there's a couple of issues. <clears throat> One is people are already used to them, people in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think it'd be a good idea to do it for that reason. And the other one is a political, basically a political reason, and that is people have gotten used to them and it would, mm -hmm. it would be problematic. And the third and as important is it would be costly to start trying to do studies on every stop sign right. section and yeah. moving all the stuff. So, so I was just gonna add so those three things combined to me, it's, 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 it's impractical. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's I don't think it'd be a wise thing to do. No. Has there been any conversation about revisiting this policy considering it looks like it was done in 2000 so it's 21 years old right i'm just curious because the MUTCD is updated twice since that time well, the so sta standards are slightly different now they are slightly but i think if you look at them the, the standard is still well below what the MUTCD is my yes. that's correct jason mm -hmm. right. yeah. so we lowered it by 50 percent I would be hes very hesitant unless there is a substantial reason. We, I mean, we look at all, every one of them individually, but there would have to be a good reason to put a stop sign in that didn't meet the standard because it really doesn't. It's 
safety wise, even it's not a good idea to put in stop signs where they don't belong. Just, mm -hmm. It's just the eight hours of an average day is usually pretty hard to meet eight, eight full hours. Right. Would you be open, Steve, would you be open to considering it? I mean, I'm, fairness is a big deal to me. So let's say there was a stop sign that didn't meet these criteria that people report traffic's running all the time because the stop sign doesn't make any sense. Would you be open to revisiting that kind of situation? As far as removing it? Yeah. I mean, we would be open to it, but again, when you talk about an idea of fairness and standards, it really wouldn't be fair to take a look at one, take one down. If not, we weren't going to take a look. You got to start somewhere. So you know. but again, we would be open to it. Right? Yeah. It'd be difficult to assess, though, because unless we put an officer or some body there, it's really difficult to say that the people aren't stopping at it. Again, and I don't have to tell you, everybody doesn't always stop at a dead stop, but they never stop sign. Yeah. But they do come to a fairly good, you know, if not a stop or one or two mile per hour, which is kind of the same effect. Right. Mm -hmm. So it would be very difficult to determine which one's being run so much we want to take them down. Mm -hmm. But we'd be open to it. Again, if there's mm -hmm. something worse, the, the residents, but really we're open to anything and taking a look at, at whatever at, uh, the residents in that area might want to do. Again, I would be surprised if you find any stop sign in any residential area where you would get a petition that said the majority of the thing, mm -hmm. residents would want that sign to come down. <laughs> never, yeah, I've never had a call like that. <laughs> yeah, to say it, that kind of calls never come across my desk. <laughs> my, my perception is that Webster Groves is a pedestrian friendly environment. I don't know whether that's a, a stated objective, but it just seems like a community that is um, friendly toward pedestrians, bicycles, and, and others. Is, is that a fair statement? I mean, is that? I think it's a fair statement. It's a walkable community. And yeah. again, that's one of the okay. reasons why we reduce those standards is because our streets are narrow. We do have a dense population in a, in a you know, small right. area. So we felt that it was reasonable to do look at these standards as opposed to going with the UPC, right. which have much stricter standards. Well, as a walker, I thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions before we move on to the next one? All right, stop signs should never be used for speed control. Um, and, I, and we put this in there kind of in bold. Um, it really to emphasize that because it has been proven that stop signs do not control speed. Uh, we'll get into a little bit like mid, mid block stop signs and whatnot. Uh, it has been studied over and over that drivers uh, disobey them completely. Um, they actually speed up faster then in between stop signs because they feel that their their time has been hindered because of the stop signs or too many stop signs. I've never done that. <laughs> my younger, Here we go, mid block my stop signs. Days. So the only time that we uh, we, we look at a mid block stop sign would really be used for pedestrian crossing in a high traffic area. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would the reason being is stop uh, crosswalks require additional resources. You know, the stop signs mid block ones require additional resources such as crosswalks, additional language, additional signage. Uh, you know, put up early Satan stop sign ahead, that kind of thing, and then protective meetings and stuff like that has to be put in. So, uh, mid block stop signs are not recommended uh, ever. Do we have any in Webster? We have a few. Yeah. The one that they made, the primary one I can think of is the one on Big Ben. Uh, they put in for, for high school students. And it's a mid block between. It's, it's at Selma. Yeah, it's that song. Mm -hmm. I got you. Yeah, and then within 150 yards east of that, they have another oh, one right. at uh, Plymouth. Uh, there's yeah. one on Big Ben at uh, West Glendale. At West Glendale, right. yes. Those are two that I can think of. Yeah, that, yeah, the West Glendale one, is, that's at a crosswalk as well. Yeah. All right, so the 85th percentile, let's, let's get in and explain this. 85th percentile speed. This is about speed enforcement and the traffic flow of the set speed limits on a roadway. Speed at or below which 85% of the motor vehicles travel. This is the speed most drivers feel comfortable driving and that the roadway can handle under normal driving conditions. When a speed limit is to be posted, it should be the 85th percentile of free flowing traffic rounded up to the nearest 10 kilometer or five mile per hour increment. The statement is not a standard, rather it's a guidance and is so identified in the MUTCD. And the introduction of the MUTCD should is a guidance, which is defined as a statement of recommended but not mandatory practice 
In typical situations where deviation is allowed, if engineering judgment or engineering study indicates the deviation to be appropriate. So we're talking about there, if we do a traffic study on, on Elm Avenue and 85% of the cars are traveling 30 mile an hour, 25, well, 27 mile an hour, 85% of them are doing 27 mile an hour. Well, that would be recommended to put the speed limit set on that street up to 30 mile an hour, all right? The next five mile per hour increment. The last actual study we did there, <clears throat> which was in 2013, I believe, was when the close 40, the 85th percentile on Elm was 31 point something miles per hour, which is six miles per hour over what the post limit was set. Yes. So, so based off of that, if we could have, could have recommended upping the speed limit to 35 on Elm. So, so then people would go 55. Well, we did. So we did. So we didn't do that. Thank you. <laughs> I mentioned I live on Elm. <laughs> so, so any questions about about how that happens? So we we study the traffic flow, and then we look at that the eighty fifth percentile, and that's where we look at judgment. So, um, you you all will receive plenty of complaints about wanting to change speed limits on some roadways. Um, and then when we look at those, when, I, when we present those to you all, uh, that's really what we need to look at is the 85th percentile because we will do a study and present that data to you as well. But as you said, this is just a recommendation. It's not mandatory. Not. So that leaves a little wiggle room. It does. For unusual circumstances. Correct. Particularly the, you know, the engineering judgments or something like that comes in where the roadway is very narrow or right. um, Parking on one side reduces traffic flow, you know, reduces the amount of that, or it's a, a, a really weird shaped road, like some over here in, in North and West Park that has mm -hmm. really some really weird turns and stuff like that. So we can look at some engineering on that uh, and, and then base it off of that. So you're correct. It is a recommendation, uh, but not a mandatory thing. Mm -hmm. Any questions on this? All right, yield signs. Yield signs are, uh, they assign right away to traffic on certain approaches to an intersection. Vehicles, vehicles controlled by a yield sign need to slow down or stop when necessary to avoid interfering with the conflicting traffic or the traffic on the arterial roadway, right? That's what a yield sign is designed to do when a vehicle is coming into approaching an intersection. It's designed to make them slow down. All right, yield signs may be used instead of stop signs if engineering judgment indicates that one or more of the following conditions exist. When the ability to see all potential conflicting traffic is sufficient to allow a road user traveling at the posted speed limit, the 85th percentile speed, or the statutory speed to pass through the intersection or to stop in a reasonable, safe manner. If controlling a merge type movement on the entering roadway where acceleration geometry and or sight distance is not adequate for merging traffic operation, or the secondary crossroad of a divided highway, do we even have any divided highways? We do not. So the, I read this earlier. The only yield sign that we've ever put in, we only get calls for stop signs, but on Gore, as you're turning onto Kirkham on those little ramps, uh, we did change it from a stop sign to a yield, yield sign, sign. Uh, several years ago. But honestly, in all my time, that's the only mm -hmm. one that we have ever installed a yield sign. And that was a stop sign. So we did change it to a yield sign. What's a Portland and Plant? I'm not sure, yeah, well, but I don't do, think that's a four-way we stop. Do, we do have some yield signs. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, we probably, yeah. now that I think about it, maybe 15 intersections throughout the whole okay. city, but I don't, those have been there for a okay. long time. Okay. So it's a new request. We okay. just don't I, see those okay. with yield signs. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the intersection where a special problem exists and or where engineering judgment indicates the problem would be susceptible to correction by the use of the yield sign. No parking requests. This is a big one we get a ton of. Webster grows as many narrow streets as we've discussed previously that make parking on both sides of the street not possible. It's impossible to put two cars on both sides of the street. And the reason being by city ordinance, uh, it states that you have to have 10 foot of open driving surface uh, available. And we have a lot of narrow streets in here that if you parked on both sides of the road, you would not have a 10 foot open driveway. And if the request does not violate any ordinance, the requester should obtain a petition again with signature of small affected residents and submit it to the TAC. And most petitions never get submitted because once they go out around asking their resident neighbors, they're like, uh, no, I'm not giving up parking in front of my house. Mm -hmm. So, but the big, the key here is the city ordinance of 10 foot. Uh, let's remember that. 
we, excuse me, we have one that will be coming before council at the next meeting. And that's sort of the reason, and one of the reasons why I didn't go to the TAC is, is with parking on both sides, um, Sergeant Flannery measured it, it is less than 10 feet. So we needed to restrict that uh, regardless. Right, yeah, so that one's not, not coming to TAC. It's going straight to council to have no parking along one side of that street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I, I see you got a chat up there. I don't know if that's public or if that's I have no idea, sewer. I would imagine probably sewer. I uh, think Marshall and Summer. If it's more, more, yeah, it's more. I, I have no idea. It's that is it MSD? It's a multi phase one. We just that's a question for Water public works, public works yeah. and, and we don't have an answer for that. Yeah, we can let her know. I'll let Jennifer know. Okay, but thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Going back to the last page, um, yes, and you commented on. So, you know, like residents don't want to give up their parking, but the, but the way around that seems to be residential parking only. So, we have a, a it's, again, it's not a, a, an ordinance, but the city council did approve a policy on what areas qualified for residential parking only. Okay. And again, there's a reason for that. It, these are public streets, um, the entire city uh, pays for it, taxes. People pay for our highway taxes, so we really don't want to blanket to blanket permission to people to have resident parking only. I don't think we put that slide in there. I don't remember seeing it. Yeah. We do not. But the but the, but the off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly. So I can look that up, and I will get that to you. It's within one thousand feet of a um, commercial a business. Or an educational institution who has employees or students in, at 500 or in excess of 500. I believe, which I think it's a thousand feet, maybe 1500 feet. Within 1500 feet of that, residents can request resident only parking. So that's what you'll see around Western University mm -hmm. and high school. Those are the only two, two institutions that uh, qualify for it right now. Mm -hmm. If you live within, again, I don't remember the exact number. It's a thousand feet or fifteen hundred feet within that. You can request residential parking, and everybody that has that lives within that limit has already requested. We have residential parking maxed out as far as we're going. And what happens with it again as well is it really just pushes it out into other neighborhoods. So again, we need to be we need to be careful about that. There's no perfect solution to that, unfortunately. It pushes all those cars out further. Well, that's why I'm here. So yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'll explore that. One of the things, well, one of the things that we can do, and we have that, um, is for the uh, residents that don't meet the resident-only parking. We've done restricted hours parking, like from eight to nine in the morning and you know, two to three in the afternoon, and on some of them, no parking from eight a.m. to three p.m. depending on what the problem is. Right. And that, again, that's one of them. The ten foot. Um, restriction justified it, but that was the initial complaint on SWAM where we're getting ready to ask right. for no parking on both sides. Was, again, it's there because of students. They're parking there every day and clogging up both sides of the street. And but I don't think all the residents want that solution that you're suggesting. Just FYI. And I believe that. Okay. The problem is that if we measured it correct in the streets. The streets, it's less than 10 foot, and the argument says it, ha it has to be 10 foot. Right. Um, on SWAM? Mm -hmm. Yes. On which part of it? Between Sylvester and Maple. Mm -hmm. Maple. Well, they parked the plant, but we went out one extra block because they would just they do the same thing one block. block in. To keep but the again, high schoolers in the lot. Right. Door. Again, again, that's only that's only uh, during school days from eight a.m. to uh, four, four, four p.m. Why don't you just eight a.m. to nine a.m. like you did elsewhere? Some of them have asked for that. And some of them not. This one is uh, because of the ten foot. It has to be a 10 foot distance. So if we do if we do that, um, we, we're making the assumption that it's the students that are causing that problem. So well, I think that's jumping to a conclusion. I mean, I've lived there for that's been an issue that I brought to the board for 20 years. And so it's not brand new. So jumping to that now because it's a new neighbor across the street is who's been a headache for me. Um, I you know. Well, like you said, if you want to get if you want to get a petition and have all the neighbors say what they want it permanently, we can take a look at that. I got it. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, we can take a look at that. Okay. This is the again because of the ten foot thing, and the reason for that is emergency vehicles and not not for the police. For the and it's been there for twenty years. Right. Um, I, you know. yeah. I've been here for over twenty years. Yeah. So I mean, I believe you. Yeah. I'm just saying that really, it's it's the first not the first, probably not the first time, but it's the first time that we went out that, and found that it's less than ten foot space when the two when the both sides are parked there. But if, they, if the residents there, if the majority want no parking, they decide full time. But some people are open to take. Okay. I think they want fairness. I mean, they want they don't want to have the brunt of the high school parking. They want folks that are closer to the high school to bear some of that, and not at all to be dumped out. So the fact, so the fact that Webster created the problem on streets that didn't have a problem before. So and again, there. there's no good solution to that. Right. Because when we when we do that street, which we, I think will probably happen. It's going to push it someplace else. The students aren't the road, the students are going to find someplace to park. Right. And that's why it, this isn't a fix either. So are you on the on the swan board right. we're talking about? Yes. Well, it, sh it should take care of the problem there. Uh, I'm not satisfied with it creating problems elsewhere. I'm, I'm hoping that it's far enough out that it won't create a serious problem. Yeah. But if it does, yeah. we'll do the same thing as we're doing for your street. Yeah, but that took 20 years. I mean, I'm quoted in the, in the paper 20 years ago saying this will create a problem. And the, the response to the committee was, we'll get to it. Uh, you yeah. know, I'll bring you the article next time. <laughs> I, I believe it. I trust that you told me how it is. Okay. Um, I don't know. All right. No parking here to corner. That's what this says here. Here to corner. So the city has a universal ordinance in place uh, that vehicles cannot park within 30 feet of an intersection. Uh, when a request is made, no ordinance process is required. A work order is placed with public works and being deemed necessary by the police department. So the way that these happen here, no parking here to corners, um, we get a citizen that calls in and gives a complaint to myself or Sergeant Flannery. Um, Jason always goes out, he measures, he finds where the cars are parking 30 feet and we just, we have a blanket ordinance on it. I just, we just write a work order. I get Chief and I discuss these things and I say, yep, let's put up our no parking here to corner sign and then we, then we can enforce it. So, so long as everyone's following it, it, there's no need for a sign. Correct. But if it's being abused. Correct. Okay. Uh, and, and we see some of the, the latest abuse we had was around one of our parks. Um, people going to park in there, parking right okay. up to the cool. parking right up to the to the intersection because mm -hmm. they didn't want to walk extra space to get to the park and that kind of stuff. But, mm -hmm. So we just went out and measured and put signs up. Mm -hmm. All right, truck traffic, infamous truck traffic. Prohibited truck traffic excludes all trucks originating or delivering to anywhere within the city of Webster Groves, with the exception of Key West and Marshall subdivision. Uh, we've got one street over on Key West um, that we did restrict truck traffic because it was a cut through for large trucks cutting right through all the time. Um, trucks make noise, they're loud, uh, they damage streets over time. Large trucks damage streets. Uh, probably problem with prohibiting truck traffic on one street, it just moves that truck traffic to another. All right, so to prohibit truck traffic, a traffic study must be conducted to consider the road's geometry, traffic volume and characteristics, speed limits, traffic control devices, et cetera. Geometry includes such things as the number and severity of curves and grades of the, uh, and grades, uh, how, how steep it is, and or the width of the roadway. If the study determines the road may not be adequate for through trucks, then a reasonable alternative route must be available for a through truck traffic prohibition to be pursued. So that being said, if, if um, we want to pursue, you know, we want to make a no through truck traffic on one street, but we don't have an alternate route to push them to, um, we have to have an alternate route. So if it's just push them off into a subdivision, into a side road, uh, a non main thoroughfare road, uh, that creates a bigger problem. Now, does that apply to people like FedEx? No, they're local delivery. They're lo okay. So that's so, considered so it's local okay delivery. because yes. they're making delivery. Yeah. So any truck, whether they originate with inside the city of Webster's businesses or they're coming from outside Webster's businesses, as long as they're conducting business inside the city of Webster Groves, they're they are excluded from no through truck traffic Got ordinance. Because we want them to be able to make their deliveries, go to residents or businesses and make their deliveries and whatnot to conduct their business. Okay. The, the biggest thought on this is, is eliminating large trucks who are using Webster as a cut through. Yeah. They're driving north to south, east to west, and one of the main thoroughfares trying to just get through the city to get to their destination, which is not in the city. Mm -hmm. That's where we want to help through truck traffic. 
All right, any questions on the trucks? All right, crosswalk request. New crosswalk requires an engineering study that locations controlled by traffic control signals or on approaches controlled by stop or yield signs. Crosswalk lines should be installed where engineering judgment indicates that they are needed to direct pedestrians to the proper crossing path. Um, so we just went through this actually down at Hickson with the new addition. Uh, and we had to have a study done on Ambrose Way there um, where the current existing crosswalk was, but with the new configuration of the parking lot and the traffic and flow, we had to do a study on that and we actually moved that crosswalk. So where did it move to? About 50 feet south. It's now pushing students directly across onto the new walkway. Oh. Instead of at the intersection of Elm and Ambrose Way. Does it connect to the sidewalk on the other side? Is yes. Okay. Yeah. So a study like that has to be done. Is it done internally? Public by works. Public works. Mm -hmm. they, they, we have our traffic counter tubes and that kind of stuff go out when they study the traffic flow of the intersection or whatnot, determine where the best best path for a crosswalk should be. One of the things you might want to consider, and I can see on the, on the slides, is <clears throat> None of us are traffic engineers for yep. the police department. Well, I <laughs> traffic engineering study the responsibility of traffic of engineers, people who have degrees. That's our public works department. We're not the only city, but we're one of the few cities who still actually have things that flow through the police department and the traffic uh, advisory commission. The majority of cities requests go to the public works or engineering departments. They look, take a look at it, and their answer when it comes back is yes or no. We have to do this we to accommodate residents, which I think is a good thing. And so that there's some, you have some uh, leeway and flexibility in taking a look at individual situations and saying, okay, these, this, I understand the, the requirements, but this doesn't really fit here. We can, we can do something else. So just understand that when we're making recommendations, we're, we're basing it on things that are actually coming from public works and engineering studies. So. Um, and again, we're trying to give you a flavor of why it's done that way and why we should do it this way the majority of the time, but it doesn't mean there's not exceptions. So uh, you know, hopefully uh, that maybe give you a little clear picture of how we come about making the recommendations and of what we're doing. All right, any questions? Nope, that's it. That's the last slide. Any questions on anything you can think of that we didn't cover or that you would like to discuss? Yes. I'm just curious. So how many studies is the public works currently conducting on crosswalks and or what else do they conduct studies on? Don't believe we have any going right now on crosswalks. I know we have studies out on speed. Um, that's our biggest complaint. We have several of them out okay. um, and on the agenda for them to study the speed on certain roadways. Um, I don't believe we have any stop signs going right now. No stop signs, but speed enforcement okay. right now. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jay. I know one of the, the impediments is not only manpower, but also equipment. And the equipment's very expensive. And I know that, I recall in our last council budget, we had a request to get an additional speed counter at some point in the next couple of years, or maybe right. yeah. it's a, It's a very expensive equipment. Uh, right now, we really only have a couple sets. You know, they have to do traffic studies for whenever they're paving a road or, or doing grants, those kind of things. So it's, we have limited availability of it. So sometimes people make requests. Unfortunately, it takes a little while to actually get a study done. And you're speaking about those big ginormous things next to the road that say the speed, and then there's two lines that go across the That's, road? We have a track. What we can, what we can do, do sometimes is when they're, if the, the holes across there with the little counters and boxes, that's the public work stuff. And that software computerized software that gives you a detailed accurate count. We have a speed trailer that will give us a, tra a traffic count and also a speed count, but it's not nearly as reliable as the ones that the, you want uh, the public, public works do. Yeah, yeah, we want the tubes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, our speed trailer has given us some glitches here and there. And well, some, it's not made for speed counts and, and traffic and volume counts. It's made for to basically warn people you're going too fast. So um, it doesn't have the same degree of, of accuracy and reliability as the equipment that public works use. Right. Can yes. we do a round of introductions? Oh, yes. <laughs> did I did that happen before I got here? Did I miss that? Oh, well, maybe. I don't know. I have, have Kathy Gray first. <laughs> that one I figured out. Yes. <laughs> the Sergeant Flannery is what does our traffic. I'm Chief Curtis, Police Department. And 
Um, Carrie Falgrant. Steve Rizicki. David Franklin, I'm uh, on the council. Erin Clippy back there in the corner. She's just taking notes for my uh, minutes. She's our administrative assistant. I'm Ann Barenkamp, and I live on Elm. I'm a resident, and I'm just interested in making things better. Chris Renter. So may I ask, are you a resident and you're wanting and an engineering I'm a resident. expert? I live um, on Central, right by Southwest Park, and I am a traffic engineer, yeah, practicing. So, so we do uh -huh. actually have a trip. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Super cool. So, yeah. And are you a resident and you want to just. I am a resident group? and an engineer, but not a traffic engineer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you're a <laughs> resident on Swan? Right. Uh huh. Yeah. I've been bringing this issue. Franklin says, why don't you do it <laughs> on the commission? I said, well, all right. That's the only way to get heard. Yeah. 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 All right. And then there were two other members that are on the commission that are not here. And they are Robert Fox and Michael Rice. And they couldn't make it tonight. And we do have an opening on the commission. As I mentioned earlier, one guy called me and said, I moved out. Take me off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live in the city. <laughs> I have more questions, but they're yes. quick. I think they're a quick answer. Um, so, so the big request list that people call in and ask for, um, speed bumps are a no, and I understand. I wouldn't want them either because they're noisy, I feel like, people going over them. Um, but what about the 3D striping that sort of tricks drivers psychologically into thinking there's a bump and it gets them to slow down? I actually just read this yesterday. I did some research on that. Uh, what they're seeing is it's actually causing people to swerve because they're thinking they're going to hit something. So according to the MUTCD, they are 100% against it. And that's like current research. Interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had that idea too. They're cool looking, but uh, yeah, apparently the research says so yeah. yeah, we actually discussed that, and I said, do some research on that day, and let's find out what what that is. And, yeah, just for the record, there's form. a there's a middle ground there with just plain striping. Where I think you can do a lot more with plain, you know, lateral striping, um, longitudinal striping. Right. It doesn't have to go all the way to three D. We don't have a lot of heavy striping here in Webster, so. The so, most recent one is uh, Lockwood and Gray there, across from Bristol. We did the uh, blocks and the stripes across the road because of just the traffic volume and then the pedestrian crossing there. Uh -huh. That's cool. So and, this committee will be able to affect change potentially by agreeing that that would be a good idea to add more stripes of the safe sort? Actually, that's a great question because we really haven't defined the role of this, what this group does. We make recommendations to the board or to the council, right? Yes. Yes. So ultimately we can make recommendations and we could make a strong argument mm -hmm. you know, based on engineering information. But at the end of the day, the, the council has to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. But generally we'll have a <clears throat> on those kind of things, especially is that you'll make a recommendation, talk to the city manager about the recommendation, she'll put it on an agenda and bring it to actually a work session for the council. That's where the council would discuss it. And then if they <clears throat> felt like it was a good idea and affordable, that's one thing we have right. to remember as a budget item, then uh, that's when we would get the point of we could grab the targets and go to them for approval. But that's so, generally so, how the process will work. And our shared goal is just to make wiser choices and increased safety for the community? It, yes. And that's uh, certainly part of, of the mission of the Traffic Advisory Commission. And whenever, we get, whenever we get a request, in general, we try we try not, not to, to uh, bring requests that we know don't meet warrants mm -hmm. to the TAC, because it's, it's kind of a redundancy. If someone requests a speed and whatever, or, stop signs and we know and we're fairly certain it's not going to be the warrant when first we ask them to get a petition the neighbors it's always difficult to do because 50 50, 50 or whatever and then if you don't get it we don't get a majority then we discourage we don't tell them we can't but we would discourage that from happening and generally with 53 but not not but most of the neighbors don't want it. so it wouldn't come before you what you're going to see is if you get a majority of the neighbors are there some specific things that need to be done that's going to come to you as far as request if there's other things that you've, if, you know, independently taking a look at and want to discuss as a board, such as the crosswalks and things, those are always widely for discussion mm -hmm. and for recommendations to the council. Mm -hmm. 
And, and so an individual who has a concern like that could get a petition and take it directly to the council, but they could also bring it to us. Is that right? Well, they could bring it to the council, but generally what's going to happen there, not by generally, 99% of the time is the council is going to ask them to, to take it to the traffic advisor. Okay. Because they're relying upon you having this information that we've given you, and then with some experience in Chicago kind of dealing with these things, to, to be able to make it in the farm recommendation of them to either help them decide in the affirmative or in the negative. Right. And, and is the expectation that we will be only reactive to what comes our way, or are we also expected to be proactive in proposing things that to be considered? The expectation is for you to do what you feel uh, is important. Okay. So you don't need any impetus from us. Like I said, you elect a chair, and the chair is actually the person who controls the meetings. This is unusual. It's not something that's normally going to happen. The chair will control the meetings, they'll set the meetings. You can have discussions among yourself. At the next meeting, I will try and have the city attorney here because he'll maybe give you a little bit about the Sunshine Law and what you can and can't be discussing as a group or independently. But again, if you have independent ideas or see things or know things that you would like to, to discuss, you think will help with traffic safety and pedestrian safety, which is what the board is you know, part of the board commission is. You're, you know, certainly open to discussing that and making recommendations to the council based upon what you think is you know, important. And if, if people have suggestions, observations that are not, they don't rise to a petition, but they want to express that concern or proposal, is there like a suggestion box? I mean, what, what do we do with those? That's something you can discuss at, a meet, at one of your meetings. And if somebody has a suggestion, or <clears throat> whether it's they have support from other neighbors or not, it's certainly something that's open to discussion. Again, you are citizen volunteers, so I wouldn't see you wanting to get tied up for two or three hours on a night of a meeting. But if there's things that you want to discuss that you feel, feel are important, you're always open to do that at a meeting. And again, the police department doesn't control your meetings. We're here. Greg is actually going to be the liaison. So I won't be here you know, unless there's some issue you feel like I need to be here. But he and Jason will be liaisons because they, they handle traffic. They know the traffic stuff as well or better than I do on all these issues. So if you need advice or some direction or some guidance on things, they'll be here to provide that. But the board will be running the meetings and making the decisions about what recommendations you know you should and shouldn't have. Now, again, we won't be running the meetings, but they will, if we do this traffic study and they bring you something that doesn't warrant a stop sign, you may, you know, they will certainly suggest what based on the information that's something that should be recommended. And hopefully the majority of the time, unless you have a good reason not to, you'll follow, you would be following that. But again, you're free to do whatever you like. You are. You know. It's very helpful to understand that scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the past experience, recommendations from the committee are the result of consensus and majority. Uh, what's I, I don't know what the, the experience has been and what to. Past experience with recommendations from the TAC is that I would say 90% of them are accepted and passed in the articles. Uh, but I mean, the recommendation comes out as a result of a majority vote in this committee or, or as a result of the recommendation would be based upon a majority where it okay. might be i mean if you okay. you know if you have seven members and five of them vote okay. eight or okay. anything else then it's right it's a recommendation that will go to the council as being don't know the vote okay. yeah. five said yes okay. and two said no has this um committee been on hiatus for a while and we're just now reconvening yes it has been for, for two, two reasons. The primary one has been, it's been COVID. Yeah, I can yeah. make an explanation on that. But, but prior to that, we really weren't getting a lot of requests. Most of them we were able to handle up, you know, the, the, either it was warranted or not warranted, like you know, the things that we bring to you. I don't say the rubber stamp, but if they don't meet the warrants and you see the data, I would ex expect that most of the time you're going to agree with it. So we really didn't have a lot of issues coming up that needed to be addressed by the TAC. Mm -hmm. So those two things combined, yeah, it's, it's we did have a, a large issue that uh, residents we thought maybe you know we needed to get a, a meeting. That was about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Was, was last one was uh, <clears throat> in September, October, twenty nineteen. That's the last. last and then probably a year before that, one of the big issues. So it's been probably two and a half years since we really had a regular meeting. So right. yeah, so. it doesn't meet regular, not monthly. It's it's at the call of the chair. So again, uh, Grayson set the next meeting next month. And there will be some issues on that. You all need to uh, elect the chair, and then and the, the, the uh, means will be called at the recommendation of the chair. Even though the chair sets the agenda and uh, 
it runs the meetings. If you all feel there's a meeting, I'm sure that whenever you tell the chair here, we need to have a meeting, but that's you know, they do that. But again, I don't anticipate because there has been a hiatus and there are some couple of issues that are kind of on, have been put on the back burner and that we need to take a look at. I don't expect that you're going to have an abundance of work from uh, requests, but if you all have ideas about things that you think need to be done, you can meet as much as often as you like. Mm -hmm. So uh, another clarification. Um, issues that can be resolved directly because the rules are clear, you will you will make those decisions and go forward. Unless there's some controversy to it, or we, okay. we anticipate that there's some controversy to it, that's generally what would what happen. But <clears throat> again, we did it in the past because there wasn't a lot of uh, COVID, especially we weren't expecting to get a lot of participation. And we didn't have a lot of issues. So at this point, if we're having regular meetings and we have a chair and we have a committee that's active, I would expect that whenever we get a request, unless it's something you know, that just clearly doesn't meet the warrants, then we would be able to, to you know, talk to the person and reasonably, you know, they would say, okay, I understand. That probably wouldn't come. But otherwise, I would say that if we get some kind of issue, most of those are going to come to you now. Okay. Okay. The 20 year issue. <clears throat> It took a long time to get to it, but we are getting to it. <laughs> <laughs> Parking dollars in Easter and Webster. Always. Yeah, I mean, I apologize. But I, and I, I, we certainly, there's certainly been a lot of conversation. I know some points. Yeah, about I, I think that there. there's, David knows, because I've gone to him two years ago with that on this. And uh, I mean, the one that stands out for me is this gal who lives on Lockwood that doesn't have a driveway. And uh, she goes out comes back during a school day and she's going to have a public car. You know, it has carried groceries from a couple blocks away. So the the acceptance that you've done of allowing no school parking on entire blocks uh, is uh, not seem reasonable to me. You know, so I think that's the stuff for me. I mean, she's an example, but I think those of us... Uh, well, yeah, it's, uh, we, we've tried to... It's, it's been difficult, and I certainly understand that. Um, and, and sympathize with it, but it requests we're going again. We'll, we'll come basically come to you. Okay. We've done a piecemeal. There is a policy out there, and like I said, I pause that we should have had a slide on one of those things we missed. But I will make sure that you all get what that policy is, what's what qualifies. But I am 99% sure that all the uh, streets are eligible for resident only parking that are have requested it and gotten it at this point. Um, <clears throat> As far as you know, streets like yours on Swan, we did go out and measure that. It's less than 10 feet when there's two the cars are parked like that. So it really doesn't mean- Yeah, I think I kind of you out there. You kind of blew me off. <laughs> 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 Told me to go away. You were doing police yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, I hear you. But then you've got those two blocks. you got Joy and the next one. You know, and I know Holy Redeemer's there, which are ultra wide streets. And you've got the same situation. Well, those those we didn't do residential like parking. Um, uh, but there's no parking. There's what is those nine? Was it nine a.m. to four p.m. at school days on July? Yeah, well, it's basically it just bars high school students. So that's you know there's just been one after another that's pushed a high school student somewhere. But, uh, well, when the school put that lot in, that helped a little bit. Yeah, um, mm. but it's still they still are pushing out. Yeah, yeah. And I don't. If you all can come up with a good answer to it, we would appreciate it. Because mm -hmm. we really we've taken a hard look at it and just haven't found a good solution. I'm I'm a bit uncomfortable bringing this up because it, it's it's kind of an issue that's local to my neighborhood. But since we're since you're here, I just want to throw this out. Um, I live at the corner of Gore and Cedar. Gore is a very wide street, and as a result, many people think of us as a through there. To get a, to get around the traffic on Elm, mm -hmm. and so we get very we get speeders. I mean, serious speeders, 20, 30 miles over the speed limit. Um, the even the city buses uh, uh, use our street when they're not on. You know, they're off the clock, so to speak. They use our street to speed to get back to the garage in a hurry. Um, and, and and I understand that is. Are, are you aware of any 
new technology, the creative ways that we can discourage those people who, you know, we're not worried about the guy that's going five over. We're worried about the guy that's going 25 over. And yeah, it only happens three times a day. But if your kid happens to be on that street at that time, you're, you're upset. A any thoughts on that? If you recall when Highway Party shut down, mm -hmm. we had yes. the traffic coming through. We restricted left turns on right. the door from Lockwood. Right. That's one mm -hmm. solution. And again, that would be one thing that you can, if you want to think about that, that's fine. But what we found was that a lot of the residents there didn't like that because they wanted to be able to make that left turn. Yes. So that, that's another issue. But that's probably the primary way that you can do that is by restricting um, left turns at certain hours of the day or through traffic on there. Other than that, I can't, really, I mean, we can't, we try and reinforce as much as we can. We have limited resources. We can't, no, let's we, there, right? Yeah. Um, well, while we're on the subject, it does bring out this, and that probably just something that you need to be, be aware of, and a lot of people aren't familiar with, and we, I don't, we won't make it, publicize it too much, and that is there's prosecutorial discretion on speed limits. So if you have a 25 mile an hour speed limit, we generally aren't going to write you a ticket unless you're doing 10 miles an hour over. And the reason for that is the court likes to be make sure that they're prosecuting a good ticket. Mm -hmm. So they're prosecuting what? A good a good ticket. Oh, yeah. Because there, <clears throat> I don't really think there's a lot of error in it, but it's the same thing as you'd rather let 10 men go free than convict one man who's not guilty. So they look at it as okay, the speed limit is 25. If you've clocked in a radar at 10 over, they definitely were speeding. So they are comfortable with that. Anything less than that, they really aren't comfortable prosecuting it. So we don't generally aren't, aren't going to issue a citation for unless it's 10 miles an hour over. If we get a lot of complaints like your street there, or we're doing target enforcement, we'll write warnings at five over, but you're probably not going to see any tickets for any citations that aren't 10 or more. And again, it's because the judge wants to make sure that when they're convicting somebody on speaking citation, that it's a good citation. Yes, but uh, the Douglas Hill project, so a lot of the complaints have been concerned about traffic. I mean, is that just going to play out? Or, you know, there's somebody did a traffic study. That was me. You, oh, so you did a study. <laughs> I did the study. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I, I, <laughs> you're probably going to agree with me on this. As I told you, we, the police department, are traffic engineers. Right. So anything, any opinion we would have would just be that, just an opinion. Yeah. We would we would ask whoever on whatever rely upon actual engineering traffic studies and rely upon those to, to have a much more informed opinion on what traffic is. I would not, I would not want to try and give an opinion of what I thought was going to happen. For the record, that study, if you look at it, it's clearly marked draft. It is step one of a study. Okay. We haven't been able to really engage public works yet on steps two, three, and four. So people keep talking yeah. about that the study is recommending this or the study has found this and the yeah. study hasn't found or recommended anything yet okay. because we have not been able to coordinate yet with public works. Okay. What's the so, location on that one? That's Douglas Hill, the new development being proposed oh, oh, oh. north of the tracks. Yeah. Right. North of, well, yeah. Or, yeah. So, yeah. but there will be a full study done just for the record. <laughs> and in your opinion, it's, um, Things are happening in the right order as far as yeah i mean i think it, they're happening a little slowly especially considering how much the public wants to know about traffic yeah um, but yeah. that's out of our hands okay. so i know the city's very very busy so um okay. uh, but what i can tell you is it'll, there'll be more traffic obviously there'll be a lot more yeah. but um there's also lots of ways to manage additional traffic um depending on what the city has an appetite for and what it you know can be installed so um you know, I think, and again, historically, traffic engineers said yes or no, and people hated that because a lot of traffic engineers would stand up and say, no, this is bad for cars, we, we won't do this. Mm -hmm. And modern traffic engineers, our job is to say, here's how we can make this work. Mm -hmm. So we don't say yes or no anymore. We say, here's what we need to do to make it work. Mm -hmm. And now I'm finding with Douglas Hill, people are very upset <laughs> because we're not saying, no, this can't happen. <laughs> or yes, this can happen. We're saying, this is what we would need to do to make it work. <laughs> Sure. Can't wait for losing. Yeah, I know. It's the story of my life. It's a very nice place to paint a target. Traffic, yeah. traffic and drainage yeah. is pretty much the two targets. 
So, but in answer to your question, um, for the record, encourage your neighbors to park on the street. Um, Gore is really, really wide. I make this mm -hmm. comment all the time. It's basically a runway. Yep. So the wider it is, the more people are going to speed because there's no they visual impediments. Right. There's no physical impediments. Um, and beyond that, like longitudinal edge line striping would that would be a great location for that. That's something you got to work through. As they mentioned, public works, and then you get a you get a maintenance cost or you know to that. Um, but something as simple as four inch stripes that striped out parking lanes that would visually narrow the street um, would would potentially would help. Yes, I had a uh, citizen a couple of years ago recommend that I read this book. I forget the name of it now, but I'll have to send it to you. But uh, one of the chapters was about how there's natural uh, barriers to slow down traffic. One of them is parking on the street. Yes. I thought that was really interesting because so often, at least in, in lecture from a planning perspective, they're like trying to get cars off the street. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because I've done yeah. some parking studies for the Webster Commercial District, and I, I really want to include the ability to park on gray and board. And I'm never allowed to include that because the residents would get very upset. <laughs> but I'm like, they're 40 feet wide and nobody's parked mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not allowed to talk about parking on those streets. <laughs> um, but that's true. Anytime you have a anything that is so much of driving is is psychological. Mm -hmm. So anytime you think there's an impediment there, you naturally slow down. Yeah. So thanks for that tip. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, I can brainstorm on more too. <laughs> I was hoping that there might be a new technology out there that would, you know, help to help those speeders recognize that their behavior is out of line. Right, right. I mean, you do a lot of striping and speed tables. That's why I asked about those. They're not popular with public works. I mean, Webster's not the only one, but Kirkwood's installing a lot of them. They're just they're a much flatter mm -hmm. speed bump, um, but they aren't again. They have to be well designed because they can block drainage and they also yeah. you have to plow over them. <laughs> I remember someone like recommended a crosswalk that was like painted in rainbow colors, like brighten it up and everything. And you know, the data was showing that uh the majority of people crossing that area are people that live around there, so they're used to it. So by the by, you know, by a month or two months out, they're going to just as fast as they were prior. Yes, yeah. yeah. So even yeah. like the quote unquote new technology, it's like is it really helping? Mm -hmm. Right. Sometimes it's, yeah. So. Yeah. It's kind of like how I like the idea of this 3D construction thing, but I always wonder, like, but for me, once I do it the first time, I'm like, oh, I know it's okay for me to go right. that yeah. Yeah. But that is a good point. Research is showing it's kind of jarring and kind of speaks yeah. drivers. Um, but this, you know, loud striping and bright striping can be helpful because if nothing else, it alerts a driver to the potential presence. Yeah. Pedestrians or people in the roadway, mm -hmm. so they're a little more apt to be aware. Yeah. <laughs> there's something to be said for a community signaling that it cares by doing ex excessive signage and I striping. Mm -hmm. agree. That's, That's my. What, I'm glad to hear we can be proactive because yeah. I think there's we have some opportunities for some pedestrian facilities in, yeah. in the yeah. city that just aren't aren't there yet. That hopefully we can re recommend. The things you're talking about that are on the street. Things are much more effective than signage, and a couple of reasons I say that are number one is that the residents really aren't wild well about putting up lots of signs. It's the study mm -hmm. streetscapes in the center are ruined by that, so mm. that's one thing you want to keep in mind about that. But I, I don't think they're really all that effective anyway. I think it's much more effective than the things you're, you're talking about in terms mm -hmm. of the, yeah. the new stripings and uh, things that, that will help. You know, visionary as opposed to the signage. It's mm -hmm. true. They call it sign noise, visual noise. People just tune it out, mm -hmm. just like any other kind of noise. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. sorry, I will totally. I'm gonna apologize ahead because I will geek out over this stuff. No, this is great. This no, is, this is my job. Yeah, I like, like it. Here. And I, that's why I'm here. I geek out over this stuff. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anything else? Call for adjournment. So moved. Second, second. All, in favor. All right, meeting adjourned. I will send an email out. Let everybody know when the next one is with some more agenda topics. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot of your time. Well, something mm -hmm. And Baron Camp, you have to brush up on our Robert's rules. Yes. Yes. You walk yeah. by your house up there all the time. <laughs> oh, Are you across from me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Yes. I can spell it for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 That's what I think everybody doesn't realize is we are nowhere near the that the face of the Halloween dark night? Yeah. Yes, that was me. Yes. <laughs> when I had to talk like three I mean I do talk fast, but I was talking extra, extra fast that <laughs> 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 